Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Good evening, and thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express in our Act 4 finale series. So at the top of the show, as I'd like to do, I'd like to thank you, the listener, and you, the Patreon supporter. You can support us on Patreon if you'd like. You can find us over on patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. We have diligently tried to woo you towards our YouTube channel. If you've not subscribed to us on YouTube, please do. We are uh, still making our charge for a thousand subscribers and uh, looking to give away a very unique prize once we arrive there. And so with that in the bag, I will turn to our investigative team and ask them to introduce themselves to my right. Hi there, this is Mike and I play James Robert Fraser who's been thoroughly enjoying a nice meal, a little drinky, and a bit of a sing-song. And to Mr. Fraser's right. Hi, this is Rena. I play Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy, and there's been some troubling dynamics around here lately. Yeah, I think the easiest way to put it for you would be some things have changed. You've enlightened yourself, and the dynamics are strange. And perhaps it's time for Lady E to have her own say. At the end of the table. Hi, this is Giles, and I'm playing Simon Griffith. Simon is enjoying music, song, and a good time, and therefore is just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, you have had an opportunity to enjoy a pastoral experience at a rustic estate alongside many children and uh, members of the mayor's family who have uh, put on quite a show for you. Uh, to Mr. Griffiths, right? Hi, this is Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger. And I'm starting to think that we got the short end of the deal on the housing arrangements. Yeah, I mean, it's true that it seems the boys have enjoyed sort of a festive time with a bunch of good home cooked food, liquor, and uh, beer and the like. And the ladies were treated to a, a cold room with a couple of cots in it, and they can relax in for the rest of the evening. So I think you should take it up with management, quite honestly. Uh, and last but most certainly not least, I'm Martin and I'm playing Richard Courtney and uh, poor old Richard's got a a hell of a headache, I think. Yeah. You know, drinking copious amounts of wine and potentially gin on the same night seems to have left him in quite a state. Uh, It looks like he's not even waking up where he fell asleep, which is the goal of anyone who's imbibed that much. So before we raise the curtain tonight, we need to get a couple of things out of the way. One of them is a luck refresh. So I'm going to turn right around to Mr. Fraser, played by Spike, and ask him to roll luck for me. My luck is currently 66, so here goes nothing. Yeah, that's a success. All right. And you can take seven points of luck. Lovely, thank you very much. Lady Elizabeth. Okay, so I currently have 65 luck. (laughs) And I rolled a 70. Ooh. And I am going to give you 17 points of luck. Jesus Christ. Uh, And Mr. Griffith, played by Giles. Well, shit. I rolled a one. Ooh. Fantastic. Something is better than nothing. And you can have eight. And you get five luck for rolling a one. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose that's technically true, right? So eight plus five, 14. Yeah, go ahead. It's a critical success. There's no reason not to. Certainly, I'll take it from you later. Perfectly fine. Uh, and then uh, Miss Bellinger, because we don't want to pass up Miranda. We would never do that. I have 66 luck right now. And I rolled 26. Hmm. You know, as luck would have it, I'm going to give you three points of luck. Uh, that was exactly how much luck I was hoping for, Mike. Glad to give you everything that you're looking for. Uh, and then last, but most certainly not least, if we can. Richard has, oh dear, 
That's worse than I remember. 16 luck. And 48. Oh, that's good. Good for the professor, who gets a, a fantastic roll. You can take 15 points of luck, professor. Up to 31. We'll mind that. Now, now that we've given out luck, we're going to turn back to our first chair because we are going to immediately enter an investigative improvement portion of our story. So, if you would, Mr. Fraser, um, if you could give us just the beginning of the list and we'll head on down from there. Surely. Um, so the first uh, tick I have on my sheet is for Dodge. When that happened was probably about 100 years ago. Uh, my Dodge is 55 at the moment. And that is a splendid 11. Mm. All right, then. My next one is Fighting Brawl, which is 36. That's a 69. Nice. I'll give you a D10 here. Ooh, take 10 points of Fighting Brawl. Woohoo! Splendid. Next one up is Handgun, 34. 81. All right. Ooh, that is a nine. Next one is first aid. 50. That's a 58 over 50 for my first aid. Mm hmm. That's seven. Uh, listen, 60. 21. So listen is no. Natural world, 28. 42. Ah. That's six points of natural world. Thank you. Psychology, 62. 90. Just one. One is better than zero. This is the one I really wanted to fail. This is my spot hidden, which is currently 86. Yeah, that's a success. Close, but no cigar. Stealth, 69. And that's a 33. Um, my final one is my swim. Now, I know when I did that, this is when I was wrestling a nudie Maggie. So swim's 20. I rolled a 100. Absolutely. Take seven more points. Thank you very much. And that is me. All right. Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy. I don't have as many as uh, Mr. Fraser to roll. But we'll start with library use, which is at 80. And I rolled a 99. Ooh. And I rolled an eight. Sweet. So close. So close. Next is listen. But I passed that with a 007. So nothing there. Cult is 67. And I rolled a 68. <laughs> That's nice. Just by one. Just by one. But I made it. Take six points of that. And next is spot hidden. Which I have 63 in. I rolled a 15. So nothing there. And my last one is stealth. My stealth is 28, and I rolled a 67. Your stealth is now seven points higher. Fantastic. That's me, then. Very good. Simon, at the end of the table, as played by Giles. Alrighty. My first one is climb, which is from the cave tunnels, when I climbed over an objective. And that is a 91 over 20. Ooh. You can have five more points of climb. It's a listen roll, and unfortunately, I couldn't tell you when that occurred. I think I passed a few. And that is a 74 over 45. Okay. Take seven more points. Next is Natural World. Uh, I have a 50 in it. And that's a 31. Okay. Uh, next is Spot Hidden, currently at 51. And that's a 55, so that is a fail. Very good. That's 10 more points for you. Very nice. Uh, track at 30. And that's a 48. Truly, who among us could compare? Uh, that's seven more points of track for you. Uh, next is demolitions when I freed Mr. Fraser from the jail. And that is a 98 over 30. Take nine more points of demolitions. And now a third of the time, I will not blow my fingers off. Just a third. And you've got ten fingers, so... This is true. I have extra fingers. 
a spirit lore of nine when I made that haunted house roll. And that is a 75. And that is four more points of spirit lore. I still have three more. Science geology at 56. That's an 87. All right. Science geology goes up by seven points. Oh, very nice. 63. And I made that wonderful harmonica roll last session. And that's a 56 over 27. Six more points of harmonica. 33. And last but not least is submachine gun firearms at 15. Oh, and that's an odd five. Well, sadly, that does not go up. Uh, so we'll now move to the incomparable Maggie Bellinger. Hello, hello. So my first one is Drive Auto, which I, I think we all know that Maggie's an excellent and astute driver. So there's no shock there that I would have passed. I mean, I rolled a 70 over 40 for her skill improvement. Fantastic. Uh, take four more points of Drive Auto. And then uh, I have a uh, Fighting Brawl. Uh, which it was a pass at uh, 21 under 40. Your fighting brawls are 40. Ooh. Yeah. Maggie can punch some things. Uh, library use. 14 under 66. See, I'm just too good at these things. It's problematic now. Uh, listen, I currently 77 and I rolled a nine. <laughs> Why are these all rolls now? I need them to be rolls later. I don't know. And they won't be here later. You know it. I know. Persuade is a 20 and I rolled a 16 <laughs> but I'm glad I could drive better <laughs> roll 20 is officially hating on Miss Ballinger today my last but not least is spot hidden which is a 25 and I fumbled it I rolled a 100 okay or sorry my spot hidden is a 53 I rolled a 100 could take 9 points of spot hidden oh okay which isn't bad it's a very useful skill it can be yes until it gets too high and then it becomes your detriment because you can't fail a spot and roll when you really want to. So last but certainly not least, of course, uh, Professor Richard Courtney as played by Martin. So just before Richard was shot at the station, he made a spot hidden roll. Current spot hidden is 77. Oh, and I rolled a 72. Never mind. He persuaded some policemen and he's got a persuade of 58. Ooh, 63. Right. That's a fail. Um, from 58 to yeah, eight more points. Very good. And he made a regular listen roll around about the same time. And his listen is currently 55. Rolled a 63 again. There we go. Nine more points of listen. Nine listen. So that's 64. That's about it. All right. So with luck and improvement done, we'll lift our curtain. So morning arrives for the first time in memory, at least in some time for you, Professor. You wake up with a terribly dry throat and your head is throbbing this morning. It feels like a few elephants came over the Himalayas and pounded down on top of your head. You are laying on a straw bed. You can feel the itchy straw underneath you flex and twist. You feel a bit of a, a blanket beneath you as well. Your eyes part just slightly and you can just catch the this hazy image in front of you. And when your eyes finally come into focus, what you see is the somewhat cherub face of a young girl no more than six or maybe seven years old. And she's staring, smiling at you. I think Richard will, um, he's got memories of seeing some bright lights and there was somebody who shot him. You remember, you get a flash of a band playing in a hotel bar somewhere and you see Maggie's face and she's laughing and she's red from all the fun that you're having. There are people about, some of them are dancing, and you're having just this raucous time. And you you keep turning to your right and turning, and the image compels over and over and over again. And you see this same sort of gentleman filling your glass over and over. 
with this amazing wine that you continue to drink. You're not really sure how much you've had. Can, can you get me some water, please? A little water? And he goes to sort of tip his uh, uh, an imaginary glass to his mouth. Mm-hmm. She giggles. And then she says something in a language you're not familiar with. And then she begins babbling. I, uh, I, 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 I'm afraid I don't speak your language. Do you, do you speak English? You hear some heavy footsteps enter the room and you hear another man. It's, it's a male's voice for sure. Say something to this child and the child turns and the man reaches out for her. You see him in, in the doorway now of the room. He's got a big sort of bushy gray and white beard and she runs to him and he picks her up and there's this tiny little scene and he says something to you in the room but again it's not in English so you don't know what he's saying he turns and walks out is there a tap in the room there is not actually so uh, when you look down at the ground you realize that the floors are wood not too far away from you there on the other side of the room Simon is slumbering in a very similar bed and the logs which he saws are very wide. Richard is going to attempt to get up. Okay. You get up. You don't feel as if that you're um, particularly hurt in any way other than being bodily sore from just not sleeping in a what you would consider a proper bed. Since your last time on camera with us, you'll have healed four hit points. Oh, good. Um, but you are parched and need to figure out what the hell is going on. <laughs> Nothing makes sense. Uh, Richard will stumble over to Simon and start to rock him. Uh, Simon, where, where are we? Simon? What? Where, where are we? Professor, is that you? Yes, this isn't the hotel. Simon lifts his bore off his eyes and looks at him. You awake now? Uh... Yes, yes, I, I'm I'm awake, I think. How many fingers do you have? I don't know. Should I am, I, am I missing some? Count them and let me know. Richard will count his fingers. You count very carefully. You count, you have ten fingers. Uh, but they're all here. You're sober then. Good. I, yes, yes. Um, I could do with some water, but nobody speaks any English. Well, where are we? Can we get some water over here? A little, uh, well water? You ask for water sort of into the ether. And it's at this point when your bit of a bass tone in your voice kicks in. This is what you wake to, Fraser. You wake to Simon asking for water. Fraser has probably had quite a uh, solid night's sleep. He kind of <sighs> rouses himself. <clears throat> what the uh, morning? What, what time is it? Not sure, Jim, but it looks like we got the professor back amongst the living. Oh, professor, you're awake. Good, good, good. How are you feeling? Not great. Um, is there any water anywhere? I imagine so. Where have we been uh, put to bed? Are we just kind of camped out in the living room or are we actually in a bedroom? You're in a bedroom that's been converted for guests. It's one portion of this, um, of the mayor's house. I'm going to use house in a very diplomatic way. I'll, I'll go and see if I can rustle something up and uh, he will kind of heave himself um, out of whatever uh, makeshift bed he's been provided with um, and uh, stagger down the stairs in search of a glass of water or two. Yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a two story house by any means. It's, it's a, it's a single story house. So you, <laughs> you stagger through into the next room and you see many of the family members that you were partaking with and enjoying a good meal with last night are not where they were before. Uh, they seem to have woke. Uh, there's some remnants of the breakfast table that was laid out, and most of them are already outside the house, likely working. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, wow. Water? Uh... See an older woman walk towards you with a pitcher, and she nods, and she hands you a pitcher of water. Thank you. Thank you. He kind of looks around, thinking... He really should help clear up um, after the, uh, the bit of a party they had last night, but maybe not right this very second, and uh, head back through with the water to the others. 
Simon's going to follow, actually follow Jim in and he'll start, uh, he'll ask for some coffee while Jim takes the water back to the professor and then start helping clear up. They make you something like coffee. I think that's the best way I could put it. It is likely more close to a strong brewed tea, like really strong. And they also, the same woman that gave Fraser the pitcher hands you uh, a small plank of wood that has like a loaf of bread on it. And there seems to be three or four different types of cheeses and then some slices of meat, some slices of cooked meat. I'll head back into the room with uh, the water and uh, uh, here we are, Richard. Uh, some water for you. Ah, thank you. Uh, oh. where, where are we? It's, yeah, isn't I don't recognise this hotel. Yes, yes, you've been uh, rather out of it for the last uh, last wee while. Uh, we're in uh, we're in that. Uh, do you recall the fellow Todorovich mentioned that uh, he thought he knew where a, a piece of the uh, the item we're seeking is uh, is located? It's a small village about fifty miles south of the city. It's uh, called uh, Orosak, I believe, is the name of it. Uh, uh, this house is the mayor's. Uh, his name's Netic. Uh, he very kindly put us up last night. Um, we had a wee, wee bit of a do last night. They were very welcoming, um, but uh, I'm afraid you, uh, you slept through all of it. Yes, we had a, a rather rather keen waiter. Um, I don't really remember. Uh, well, uh, some lights and... I, th- I think I had a flashback to when I was shot. I... Really? Did you recall anything? Yes, yes, as, as a matter of fact, I do. I, I don't remember the, the exact words of the, uh, uh, the, the assailant, but I, I believe he said something along the lines of, um, with, with love from Mrs. Griffith or, or, or something similar. Wait, what? With what? What did you say? Uh, Mrs. Griffith. I, uh, you, you remember that odd person that, um, that had something to do with Simon? I do, I do. Um, Fraser is, Fraser's mind's racing at the moment. Best not mention it to Simon for the time being, uh, Let's discuss with the others. What did he look like, this fellow? Can you can you remember? Um, he had a gun, and uh, yes, yes, his face, man, his face. What did his face look like? An assassin's face. Oh, that's no use at all, man. What does an assassin's face look 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 like? It looks like nothing. It could look like a, a an elderly elderly woman or or a a twelve year old boy. It was a gentleman of some description. I'm going to say it's one of those people that you you, you kind of see everywhere. They're, they're, they're a face you can't describe, but it's kind of anybody. It's almost impossible to explain, but... um, Yes, no, I understand, I understand. Uh, uh, an inconspicuous face, something like that, eh? Simon comes back into the room. Simon, uh, the professor was uh, just uh, telling me he's, uh, he's feeling a lot better. Isn't that right, professor? Uh, yes, quite. Uh, yes. Like, almost like I've never been shot. It's it's healing nicely. I've been uh, I've been getting him up to speed on uh, the doings of the last day or so, after his uh, wee bit of self indulgence. <laughs> well, Professor, now that you've been shot like me and Jim, you're a man. I am I am perhaps getting a little more religious. You could call me a a holy man, or perhaps Swiss. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, I don't think I've been shot that many times, but um, no, <laughs> very good. Good we can uh, joke about these things, isn't it? Uh, is that some cheese we have here? Marvellous. Speaking of Swiss, yeah, we have a charcuterie board here for our breakfast. You all tuck in and I'm going to go help clean up in the other room. Um, they have some strong tea. Uh, it's not like coffee, but it, it, it'll wake you up. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come and help you uh, to clear up. I have a wee spot of tea. That'll perk me up. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, I, 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 give, give me a moment. I, I was going to talk to you about that relative issue, uh, um, if you recall. Oh, I yes, yes, indeed. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll join you presently, Simon. Okay. So, Simon, you're going to go uh, help clean up. The help is appreciated. It takes you probably five or ten minutes to assist with putting the house back to together. Although you get the impression from the mayor's wife, who who's the, the woman who's sort of heading up the operation, she thinks it's a little strange that you're helping. You can tell because she's having to, to show you where things go without being able to tell you because she doesn't speak a ton of English. She speaks just a little. 
But what you get from her in the end is appreciation and also a sweet roll, which no one else gets. In that time that you're helping, we'll just look back in on Fraser and Professor Courtney because it sounds like something important was happening. What did they sound like, this person? Did they, what kind of uh, an accent did they have? Did you get any uh, idea of where they might be from? Does Richard recall the an, any accent or...? They sound American. They, they sounded American. This is very bad. This is very bad indeed. I mean, who do you think it was that was after me and why? I mean, we, we never really did discover who on earth this, this, this woman was. I don't know. Why does she want me shot? I, I don't know. I can't imagine, Professor. Well, I mean, I've been accused of being bad at parties and, uh, I, I don't know, somewhat devoted to my work, but I, I don't think that's grounds for being killed, do you? Not in some circles, no. Right. I mean, my fashion sense perhaps isn't quite there, but I mean... Listen, I don't, I, I don't really think we should be flippant about this. This is a, a very serious matter. I, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, I can't. Why? Do you not think it might be something to do with uh, the mission that we are on, the objectives that we have in mind? It calls into question exactly the very nature of this, this, this person. If, if indeed this was not uh, an attempt at some sort of subterfuge on the, on the part of the, the man who shot you, then it would imply that something about the woman who uh, passed herself off as Simon's wife, something about her or the whoever it is she works for or with, they deem you to be in a position of, uh, in some way, they believe that uh, you are some sort of a threat to them. I, I don't understand how. Well, well, I mean, think, man, think what we've been doing for the last while. Think what we've been involved in. Think of your your device, your device. I mean, look at yourself in the mirror, man. Look what it's done to you. Look at the things you can do with it. I I have known people would, would kill for less than something of that like. But no, nobody knows. I've not exactly written a, a paper on it and had it published or anything. I mean, the, the only people that know of its existence, I, I, I mean, and, and my uh, uses of it is, is this group. Put it together, man. Think, yes, yes, keep going, think, think, put the steps together. It's you and me, her ladyship, Miss Ballinger, and Simon. And somebody acting on behalf of a woman that called herself Simon's wife has shot you. Now, you're a mathematician. You can do equations and calculations. Calculate that, sir. Ah, and what product do you come up with from that uh, but I, I trusted Simon. He's gotten me out of a number of pickles. There have been, in London, two dead bodies, and he was able to, yes, put off the police. He was able to call somebody, and, uh, oh. And I, and I. But consider this, Professor. Perhaps Simon trusted this woman who called herself his wife, and perhaps he confided in her, and she did seem to know an awful lot about our business, it is speculation. Perhaps it is something to do with the uh, simulacrum and that particular mission, perhaps. But why? I mean, I, I, what are we to do? Hey, how can we be sure we're not going to get shot again? It's a very real threat. This is what I've been trying to impart upon you for, for some time now. The mission that we, are, um, we have embarked on is bringing our very lives on... But it's putting our lives on the line. I don't think you've really fully appreciated the seriousness of the whole situation yet, and, and perhaps now you do. Perhaps you see that we have enemies from all quarters. We have uh, these uh, these gentlemen um, with the, the the fezes. We have the Comte, who has been following us around the countryside. We have um, this this man who calls himself her ladyship's brother. Who knows who uh, who else we have? We have the the, the Duke fellow in Lausanne. Perhaps he has uh, uh, other uh, people that he works with. There are a number of parties that have designs on us. Why 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 is it that we we seem to know so so, so little about them? And then I mean, what we know is we need to collect these pieces and put them together and destroy it and and, and get some scrolls and and but but these these people that seem to to know more. I mean, every, everybody we we talk to has got 
more information, and I'm sure Professor Smith would never have withheld anything from us. And he's not a stupid man. I'm, I'm sure he will have researched this. It, it just just seems so odd and so so peculiar. Well, yes, it is peculiar, Professor. Have you not seen all the peculiar things that have been happening? Well, I know, but surely it should be us making the discovery and understanding how this all fits together. And uh, it, it just seems that everybody else, and then there are many more parties than I'd envisaged, uh, have, have got more of a clue as to what's going on than we have. And, and But uh, how did they get there? Where was their information from? Well, perhaps they've known about it for a lot longer than we have. I mean, how, how long have we known about this thing? All we have is the information that Professor Smith gave us not that long ago, and precious little of it there was too. If he did have further research and notes, where are they? We've not seen them. God, that letter from Beddoes, but, uh, oh, I don't know. So think about it this way. The different parties that uh, are, are hot on our heels, as they say, they have had maybe many, many years, maybe generations of, of knowledge and understanding of this thing. It's been around for a very long time. The Comte, if we are to believe it, is many, many years old. Hundreds of years old, perhaps. Well, yes, maybe him, but as I say, it seems that everybody else seems to have more of a, a clue as to what's going on than, than we do. We're just collecting pieces and hoping for the best. You're absolutely right. I don't dispute that. We are, we're fumbling around in the dark. We have a single goal, and that is to find these pieces and destroy them. But we don't know what this thing is exactly or what it does. We only know that it's, it's a, some sort of dangerous artifact. And, 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 and if we don't succeed in our mission, then some great doom will befall us. It's, it's already destroying Maggie. I mean, I, we, we must find a way of whatever this other part is. We must find a someone else to take it I'm, I'm worried about the effect it's having on it well yes as we worry about the effect the uh, the device has on you I mean it's physically altered you professor well only slightly I, I wonder where it is only slightly there is Simon now returning oh listen we'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll discuss this when we've got everyone together I think is probably the best thing because you raise some very valid points professor they are with the priest, this uh, Todorovich fellow, um, put us in touch with uh, Father uh, Filipovich, I think his name is. Oh, then they're not here. I'd assume they were staying in another room. No, no, they're staying there. There wasn't room. Um, we have uh, someone to go and visit. I think we'll probably be setting off fairly soon to do so. And there is a woman. The woman lives outside the village. Uh, they call her a Granny. And uh, if we are to believe it, she has the peace we seek. You're speaking of... I just want to take a look across town. Not that town is very far. Um, at the home of uh, Father Filopovich, where Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy and Maggie are now waking to a morning filled with all sorts of sounds and smells. Good ones? Well, uh, breakfast, certainly. Um, so the father's wife is cooking breakfast. That smell sort of fills the entire home. The sounds that you're hearing are... Um, the sounds of a, a rural pastoral land, a farming community get going. So there's a, an awful lot of animal noises, cattle being moved from pasture to pasture, people getting out and working in the land itself. And then obviously all of the, well, all of the noises which uh, accompany all of that. Lady Elizabeth practically bounds out of bed. Yes, quite the night for you. Yes, indeed. And she's just up, looking around, going, well, well, the day won't uh, keep itself. We have things to do. Come along, Miss Bellinger. And just start energetically getting ready. <laughs> well, I absolutely agree. We have we have many things to, to do. We can't, uh, we can't uh, you know, dilly-dally here. So you both get dressed and, and head out into the, um, the main portion of the house, which is where the father's wife is putting out breakfast. Um, it is as fresh as one could possibly imagine breakfast being straight from the farm. So there's all manner of breads and cheeses and also eggs. And then there is, I would imagine, likely some type of uh, sweet rolls that are available for you as well. And uh, the lady of the house gestures with this basket of bread towards you, Miss Bellinger, and 
we won't say that she's fluent in English, but she's close to. She sort of gestures and said, would you like to, to eat? She sort of makes the Italian gesture for eating. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's quite nice. Mm. She offers you something to drink, which is water. And uh, and then obviously makes the same available for you, uh, Lady Elizabeth. Lady Elizabeth is eating in a way that can only be described as ravenous. Normally she just has a cup of tea and maybe a, a piece of bread and some fruit or something, but she is devouring anything in front of her. Yeah, this is probably the least ladylike method you've ever seen, Miss Bellinger. First of all, no one served her food. She took her own food. And she is eating like Simon was back at the last hotel. I've never felt closer to her. That's probably true. Yes, we must keep our uh, keep our uh, energies up for today's activities. We should, shouldn't we, Lady Elizabeth? A lot to do. Quite. One can never have too much breakfast. Yes, and we did a lot of walking yesterday. There's no soreness in your legs from yesterday's walk, Lady Elizabeth. And honestly, Maggie, Lady Elizabeth is a little... The closest I would say is she's glowing. She's really... She has a um, an uncommon vi- vitality within her. Lady Elizabeth, I believe that the f- the fresh air air out here of the countryside is is doing something something good for you. Quite, I've never felt better. Nature and all that sort of thing. So we just needed to get out of the cities. Nothing like a little jaunt into the countryside to liven one's spirits. Get back to the earth, that sort of thing. Like her eyes are literally almost like sparkling with humor, which you have never seen before. I was just thinking it's a little off-putting. She's talking directly to you and making eye contact instead of the sort of side-eye eyebrow raise. Not strange at all. Uh, yeah, I see you're finishing up quickly. We, I agree, we should finish up quickly and go see the the gentleman and set off for the day. Yes, quite. We have a lot to do, and grandmother to see, and all that sort of thing. Finding your other body part. We should go. In an strange turn of events, Miss Bellinger, Lady Elizabeth is finished with her food and leaving the table before you are. Yeah, I'm like standing up to keep up, but like also like trying to take some bites and putting food down, and I maybe like like take a roll with me to go. Listen, the roll in the pocket is an old trick. It's, it's a reasonable one as well. Okay, so the two of you get get um, prepared to leave. I guess you'd have a fair idea of where the mayor's house is if that's where you're planning on heading. I believe so. So we will make an investigator goulash, as I like to do. And it's perfect the perfect location for a goulash as well. So, gentlemen, as you're leaving the mayor's house, having gotten prepared for the day and knowing that you have to meet up with the ladies, when you leave the home, the home proper, they are 20 steps from the door. And clearly Lady Elizabeth is leading the way. She's not carrying her cane either. You'll notice she is, she is not carrying her cane and it's almost like she forgot it. If Maggie is watching, it's like she didn't even think to grab it this morning. Neither would Maggie. Good morning, ladies. Uh, you slept well, I trust. Oh, yes. I think the countryside air is, is doing wonders for uh, Lady Elizabeth and myself as well. It's quite nice. Best night I've had in quite some time. Very bracing, isn't it? Uh, you're looking uh, very well, your ladyship. Uh, Never felt better, Mr. Fraser. Wait, was it better than that night we spent at Anton's house? Maybe equal. Fraser is... Completely nonplussed by the whole thing. He has no idea what you're talking about. Well, um, are we uh, ready for our uh, little excursion? We're going to see somebody's grandmother or something? Yes, we are. The way they talk here, we're going to see everybody's grandmother. Well, not everyone. But come along, we have things to do. No use dilly-dallying. Society of grandmothers. No, 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 just the one. It's just, it's an honorary, it's a term that they call, and that's just an elderly woman, the matriarch of the 
town, I guess. Village elder, that, that kind of thing? Yes. Right, okay, yes, yes. Uh, we, we, we had somebody like that back in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the farm near Cheddar. Lady Elizabeth has already started walking off in the direction they were told to go the night before. Like she is literally just striding off without waiting to see if anyone else is coming. Let me get a handle on this scene just so we know geographically where we're going. You talked with the father and you also talked with the mayor a little bit. The father was a little bit more helpful as far as where grandmother lives. Grandmother lives in, he said, in a house in the forest. And she lives in that direction. He sort of pointed off toward a road that leads to a forest. That's about it. Now, the forest is in the distance. And so that is something to contend with, at least the the distance they're in. There is no car. There are no available horses. And so to get there, seemingly, you will be walking. Clearly, Lady Elizabeth is already striding in that direction. And so my assumption is, is that the rest of the investigators are going to do their best to keep up at the pace she is setting, which is for all of you without a role is odd. Certainly when Lady Elizabeth wants something, she can go after it. This is after two or three minutes. This is something a little different. There's no pause in her gait. There's no break as far as her pace seems to go. And so you'd all pick up on that. It's not that you can't keep up with her right she's not running flat out by any means but she's setting a very strident pace and that is something to contend with not knowing how long of a journey it will be about how far away does the um, tree line uh, look from where we are it actually doesn't look terribly far it it looks maybe um i mean f- far is a relative term but it probably looks like a couple hundred yards away maybe Oh, right. Okay. So it's not like a, a mile away or anything like that. No, it, it doesn't look that far away. Uh, but as you continue on this this pathway towards the woods, you realize that, that the tree that they're pointing to that you're heading towards is really just a, a small part of the larger forest that's there. And after you get around this slight bend in it, you see that there's an enormous forest beyond this. So it could be miles into the into the forest. And as someone who spent time in France, likely in woods like that or in that size, Fraser would know that there, there are some inherent concerns when going into the forest, potentially for several hours. Yeah. Um, what um, kind of condition is the path that we're on? Is it narrow, wide? Does it look like it's got, has it got kind of ruts like um, uh, wagons have been up and down it? Or is it just a sort of a footpath? It's a footpath. There are no wagons that go up and down it. And probably within the first hundred or so yards, uh, I'm willing to give actually pretty much everybody except Lady Elizabeth a spot hidden roll because it's something that Lady Elizabeth doesn't care about. That's a zero one. That's worth five points of luck. Flipping it. Richard got hard success, but nothing as good as that. There's nothing that'll beat that. I fumbled my spot hit roll again. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, Simon rolled a 97, but since he's got over 50, it's not a fumble. All right. So, uh, Miss Bellinger, you're going to get lost a little bit in the idyllic nature of the woodlands here, and you are going to eventually accidentally walk directly into the back of Simon, which is likely why the both of you fumble. Miss Bellinger, for your fumble, I am going to, um, I'm going to have you trip and fall and land face first in the dirt, sort of ass over tea kettle after bumping into such a broad person as Simon. It's like running into a wall effectively. And so you take it, you take a tumble. Oh, Geez, Simon, you're like a tree man. I are, are you okay, Maggie? Sorry, Miss Maggie, let me help you up. I was I was just trying to hear and see what was going on. You know, Lady E is just right ahead of us. Somewhere. Well, I am getting further away by the moment. I starting to think that maybe she's trying to get to something before I can. Well then you better run after her. Run, Maggie, run! So for those of you who succeeded, uh, I will just say for the hard success role for you, Professor, the one thing you notice specifically is uh, after about 100 to 150 yards separating yourself in this direction from the village, 
you realize that there are no grazing animals that go this way. There are no cow or sheep or other goats, etc., that seemingly go out this far. All of their pens are a little closer. And then for you, the extra special cherry on top for you, Fraser, is that you realize that there are multiple layers to the forest ahead, and you realize that the canopy blocks out the sun. Yes, I think Fraser's um, well aware of the the dangers that lurk in a uh, thick forest of this kind. He is going to urge everyone to get moving and stay together. And also, the fact that they won't have any light is some somewhat of concern. And um, yes, a flashlight or a torch or a lantern of some kind is going to be of great use if they're going deep into this forest and they're kind of heading off without any knowledge of how far they have to go or whether the path um, you know, splits up and there's multiple directions. So I think he is going to uh, attempt to, uh, to catch up with uh, Lady Elizabeth, who is um, leading the way, and just kind of make clear that um, it's going to be difficult going once we get um, more than a, a few feet in. Okay. Uh, for your part, Lady Elizabeth, the path forward has never been clearer, really. Uh, the woods and their depths do not frighten you in any way. Seems fine to me, Mr. Fraser. Nothing to be worried about. It's just a forest. Have you, your ladyship, you know that there are wild animals in the forest. It's going to be dark. We're not going to be able to see where we're going. At the very least, we need to get some sort of light. Now, we have uh, we have protection here. Of He kind of pats the, the side of his jacket. Um, should we encounter any bears, wolves, as they like? Uh, wild boars, perhaps, we might find somewhere like this. But um, if we can't see where we're going, we're not going to make very good headway. How dark does it look to me, Mike? Well, uh, it, it, it does look fairly dark ahead. Um, it looks like after that first level of forest, there's likely older growth there within, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And there probably will be fairly minimal light deep within the forest. But again, it doesn't feel like a big concern. I'm certain one of you, perhaps Mr. Griffith, brought a torch? Well, let's find out, shall we? Um, I, I wasn't uh, expecting to be going deep into a forest. Uh, I had understood the, the place we were going was just uh, just outside of town. Yes, in the forest, outside of town. I have not slowed down, by the way. I'm still walking forward as we're having this conversation. Your ladyship, I, 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 I must, I must say, I, I appreciate that you're uh, certainly much invigorated from your night's sleep here at the, in the village. But please, respectfully ask. Just hold, hold your wish for a wee minute. You may ask. Still walking. Your ladyship, please. This is this is not sensible behaviour. Your ladyship, walking off on your own into the forest. You know, we've we've all discussed how dangerous it is for anyone to go off on their own. I'm hardly on my own. You're here. Yes, but I won't be here for much longer if I have to go and get get light from the from the village so we can see where we're going. You won't be able to make any headway if you can't see where you're going, your ladyship. Fraser's really concerned. Something's wrong with the ladyship. Mr. Griffith, do you have a torch? Still walking. I, I do have a torch, and I also have some candles. I also have some red candles, too, but you don't want those right now. You're walking about carrying dynamite with you. I did say I wasn't bringing the Thompson, but I was bringing two sticks. He is an American. Of course he brought dynamite. Comes with every car repair kit here, along with the Thompson. If he has a torch, then I suppose we're good to go, as long as he doesn't drop it and break it. I mean, who would drop a flashlight and break it? That would never happen in this game. Maggie breaks into a slight jog to catch up with Lady Elizabeth after having fallen victim to Simon. It's not terribly hard to catch up with her ladyship. Um, there is a, um, I don't know, you, you feel probably pretty good getting, finally getting to see her with some energy. It's about time. Like, and the two of you sort of lead the charge they're in to get to the forest. So before long, you get to the edge of this forest where these green pastures sort of stop. And you find that a little strange, at least those of you who made the spot hidden roll noticed the, the change in landscape. Those of you who made that role will get a natural world role now. I also have the skill Survival Forest Woodland. In this particular case, it would not apply. Alrighty. 
Oh, that's a hard success. 21, and which has got 44, so it's one under a hard. Mm, fantastic. And I've got an all success. All right, so the both of you realize that the the grounds here for grazing are fantastic. It seems a fairly poor decision why no one would use them. Uh, especially you, Richard, the, the land here is top-notch for grazing animals. They, they should be grazing here. This is the best spot. I don't understand. I think this would make a, a cracking pasture land. Uh, the, 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 get, a, get a good dairy herd here, and I'm, I'm sure you, you could make some cracking cheese. Oh, it's certainly very verdant. Do you, do, you, do you think there's some sort of, I don't know, wild animals, some sort of pack of wolves or something that are uh, killing off the, the cows and the sheep or something? Oh, I have no doubt. In uh, in any environment, there is an apex predator, and uh, the forest is forest is uh, ideal terrain for uh, for a wolf. So the first few trees are fairly reasonably sized oaks with some sporadic evergreens between them. But before long, as you begin to enter this forest glen, the evergreens sort of begin to thin out, and what gets replaced are older trees definitely thicker definitely more mature and true enough to your supposition your your idea that that would seem to be bearing fruit mr fraser there is not a ton of light here now i'll be clear it is not dark because it's morning and so there is some ambient illumination that comes in from the side but the deeper you get in to the forest the more and more cover you're under, it seems. Um, and it's really at this point, as you get to the forest portion, Lady Elizabeth, where you are physically forced to slow down because you're only so able to move through completely uneven ground where there is very little trail to go through, even though there is some. Um, so the group does sort of shore up a little bit together. The, the limbs of these trees are intertwining and you're beginning to see mushrooms, toadstools, uh, an increase of of fungus that exists here. And you're also seeing wild animals, uh, large rabbits, squirrels, and then some, you're not sure if those are birds or bats, but they're definitely here. They're likely birds, but the distance that, they're, that they sit at is hard to determine which one they are. Mr. Fraser is going to check his revolver. It's in good working order and have it close to hand in case they are beset by wild beasts. Does Richard still have the gun he found in the toilet? Oh, certainly. So, I suppose then, as these trees get bigger and and older yet, you pick up on a different scent in the air, and that's rotting vegetation. It lingers here too. And as the trail continues, you can see that some of the branches and some of the taller vegetation on the ground begins to interwove and near the trail creates little bushes and brambles that you have to avoid get stuck to your clothes that sort of thing it doesn't look like anything wider than a walking person has been on this footpath in ages the ground is a little moist does it look unusually kind of thick and tangled at all Might a botany roll be of any use in this situation? I would be happy to give you a botany roll. The smell is, um, is it that kind of sweet, sickly smell of rotten fruit and uh, vegetables, uh, rotten branches, that kind of thing? Yeah, it almost smells a little like, like in some spaces it smells a little like tree moss. And then in other places it smells like rotting garbage. There's all sorts of different, different smells here. I just rolled another zero one. Uh, just after all the luck today, that's fine. Take another uh, five points of luck. Um, and then as far as the botany roll goes, do you know those gardens that produce vegetables back home that always overproduce better than anyone's in the, in the county or in the village or city? Everybody's got that one thing that they can do where they're part of that one gardening group where, wow, that person has an, these enormous pumpkins or melons, etc., cucumbers, whatnot. Well, yes, indeed. Mr. Wilson, the butcher from the uh, local village, is very, very proud of his, his prize courgettes. 
Mm, indeed. That's sort of what this is like, but on a different scale. So the trees here are on that sort of, oh, wow, these are enormous. But then looking around, everything is like that. It's like everything is growing at an enormous pace or has. And then even the dead, even the things that, that have gone to cycle, they're large as well. So the deadfall trees and branches are large. The fungi are large. There are mushrooms attached to trees and funguses attached to trees that are two or three feet in diameter. They're enormous. It's like a family of gnomes lives here. But yeah, that's, that's what your role reveals. It would not surprise you if someday someone from a history museum or someone from a, a, a horticultural, you know, uh, expedition came here and took samples. And this is a wonder, really. I'm just going to kind of stop for a moment and bend down and pick up some of the soil, rub it through my fingers, give it a sniff as well. This is very, very fertile soil. The vegetation here is is quite unusually large, very very strange, this. I wouldn't expect uh, so much life here, especially with the lack of light from the canopy. Oh, it's it's something, something very odd here. I would like, as you're continuing in, I do assume you're continuing in. If anyone's stopping or pausing or that sort of thing or changing directions, let me know. Certainly not. Just go. And I can't let Lady Elizabeth get away from me. You know, it could be that she's after another piece. I know. That's what I'm scared of. My piece. Professor, I'd like you to give me a spot hidden roll. And for the rest of you, I'd like you to give me a listen roll. The difficulty is extreme. Uh, so Richard makes that 59 under 77. Now you're adjusting a few things, Richard, just trying to get uh, a better handle to... You know, you're moving out of the way of a, a thick bramble here or maybe a, a briar patch and you, you feel that there's, you have an additional weight in, in your jacket. I failed. Are you fucking serious? I rolled a 97 over 77. This is not a fumble. Again. Um, I'm going to spend... Oh, actually, no, it needs to be an extreme success, doesn't it? It does. I failed. Okay. Mr. Griffith. Uh, 79 over 52. That's not going to cut it. Okay. Richard will feel into his pocket and see what on earth this weight is. Mm, it feels like a pencil. You take it out. It's not a pencil, though. It's a piece of... It looks like a piece of bone. There's some sort of wrap that's been placed around it. There's a loop there. It's a very strange... There's a hole through it, too. Some sort of trinket. Did I... Uh, did, what, what did I get up to? I, was there a, a period of time I, I didn't remember something? I appear to have a bone in my pocket. A bone? What, what kind of a bone? I, I don't know. This, this, this here, it's rather unusual. Simon, take a look at this. Isn't this the, uh, the, wee, tin, the wee whistle? Is it? <laughs> I'm just guessing that it is. It, it is. Uh, it appears so. How'd you get it, Professor? I, I don't know. I've been passed out, as far as I can tell, since the uh, the rather lovely uh, evening I was having with Maggie in the hotel and a gallon of wine. Well, what is all this? We're going to see somebody's grandma. There's a a, a, a flute and a magic flute, did you say? And, it, and it's this, this, this. And then Richard holds it with some degree of just this bone. Professor, it's not somebody's grandma. You have to get that through your head. It's like a title that she's granny which in the mountains would mean that she would be the one the wise woman that people would come for advice to. If you disrespect her or think little of her, she's probably going to smite you or turn you into a frog or squirrel or something along those lines. Alright? Right. right. I, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll be on my best behavior but uh I mean, good lord. I mean, it, how did she survive in a place like this? It, it, it's quite some walk back to the village for provisions. And Don't you know your fairy tales, uh, Professor? Again, they're a wise woman. Jim, you understand what I'm trying to say. 
Hi, Hansel and Gretel and so forth. Oh, come, come. Are you telling me we're going to walk into a gingerbread house? How preposterous. Well, perhaps we should be leaving a, a trail of breadcrumbs so we can find our way out again. Professor, you're carrying a bone whistle in your pocket that you don't know how it got there. That's special. And um, you are belittling the wise woman. And I'm going to stand over here about 50 paces from you. There's no way you could stand 50 paces, Simon. It's a, you'd be standing in the middle of the forest. So as these, as these three are uh, talking back and forth about the funny little trinket that has somehow found itself in Richard's pocket, I assume that Lady Elizabeth and, and Maggie are continuing. Oh, yes. Haven't stopped. Absolutely. Very good. So there's a slight gap between the two groups. And so, ladies, you're the first to see what looks like a, a light in the middle of the forest. Maybe that's a campfire. You begin to smell fresh baked bread. Just the lingering scent of cinnamon as well. Oh, well, that's quite nice. Seems we're in the right place, Miss Bellinger. Yes. Gentlemen, you uh, bring up the rear, as it were. And there's a few competing things for your senses here I want to kind of get a hold of. The air here is fairly cold overall. The atmosphere is damp, moist with all of the held in rain, likely from the recent days. But on the undercurrent there, you three too begin to pick up this smell of baked bread. Just in the distance there, ladies, for the two of you, there is the shape of a cottage in the center of a few trees. Well, Come along, Maggie. This seems to fit the bill for our granny's house. We head towards it. Okay. You head towards the cottage. It's made of a relatively pale brown, rough-hewn wood. There's a small circular fence around it. It looks like that fence might be made of briarwood. And as you get closer to it, there is definitely something about this place... Lady Elizabeth, that feels a little familiar. It's hard to put finger on directly, but there's something here. Gentlemen, getting closer, I'll ask you to make a spot hidden roll. For the ladies, I'm going to have you make each make a luck roll. Hell yeah, 56 under 69. 75 under 82. Very good. Richard makes his spot hidden with a 68 under 77. Okay. 34 under 61. Yeah, it's a normal success for me as well. Okay. So you all, whether by luck or whether by being careful, manage to get around the briarwood fencing that's here. Uh, It is purpose-built, likely to keep wolves, other small predators or animals out uh, of this space. You see that there are a few chickens outside that have their own space where they are uh, likely doing what chickens do daily, which is eat and probably make eggs. Ladies, you hear a woman's voice from inside humming. It's a pleasant melody. It sort of moves back and forth through the air. Well, that's almost reassuring, honestly. Gentlemen, you catch up. Um, Not to put too fine a point on it, does anybody think we should have bought a translator. I mean, this far in the woods, I I doubt whether English is uh, is their first language. Do you know, Professor, I have a sneaking suspicion that Granny will be able to understand us perfectly well. Oh, this is just getting stranger and stranger. I agree with Jim. I have a feeling that uh, she's also going to know why we're there. If I recall correctly, um, she made that we uh, that wee whistle you've got in your pocket. But no doubt somebody in the house slipped in into your coat while you were sleeping. I'm knocking on the door. Okay. You knock on the door. You hear the hum get a little louder. Like it's coming towards the door. And as it comes towards the door, you hear the creak of the cottage door as it opens. And the face that stares back at you is one that you recognize. It smiles broadly 
and continues to hum. For those of you who are a little unfamiliar, the woman standing in this doorway has it's a pleasant appearance, a wide smile, long hair, a beautiful green sparkle to her eyes. And she's dressed in fairly, I guess rustic is the best way to put it, handmade clothes. She has a long, dark brown tunic on, goes down a bit below her knees. She wears a belt and uh, no, no footwear to speak of. She has a captivating gaze when she looks out over the crowd of uh, people before her. You can tell that her smile is very pleasant and she's humming and she turns back towards the interior of the home and she waves you all in. And and that's where I'm going to call this episode to a close. So thank you so much for joining us on the beginning of our finale of Act 4. I look forward to seeing what happens next week.